Good evening and welcome to the Pacific Spine and Pain Society's training webinar series. This is session three, focusing on minimally invasive spine decompression. We are so glad you have joined us this evening. We will begin the webinar promptly in two minutes to allow more people time to join us. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We will begin promptly at 6.02. Good evening and welcome to the Pacific Spine and Pain Society's training webinar series. This is session three, focusing on minimally invasive spine decompression. We are so glad you've joined us this evening. We will begin the webinar in just one minute to give a few more people time to log on and join us. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. We will begin promptly in one minute. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Pacific Spine and Pain Society's training webinar series. This is session three, focusing on minimally invasive spine decompression. I would like to begin the webinar now and welcome our panelists and our moderators. Team, take it away. Michelle, thank you so much for uh, organizing and the kind words. You know, we're so in our session three of the PSPS uh, training webinar series, and this uh, evening we're going to be focused on minimally invasive spine techniques. And when we think about our space and we think about the innovation in our space, I think as uh, pain providers, we oftentimes think about intervention to treat spinal stenosis through a needle uh, with epidural interventions and Largely, uh, those things work, but when we think about the data that we have for the longevity of them, we certainly can do better. And so our space really has been focused on minimally invasive strategies to improve the longevity of neurogenic claudication management. And we have the pleasure tonight uh, to focus on some of those techniques. We're gonna talk a little bit about the background, the data, and some of the considerations for patient selection uh, employing both a direct and an indirect way in treating spinal stenosis. And I have the pleasure of uh, uh, introducing some really uh, important figures in our pain space and in our spine space. Um, as we all know, uh, the Pacific Spine and Pain Society is a collaborative society focused on I think bringing together the specialties that, that treat both pain and spine, spanning uh, pain medicine, orthopedics, neurosurgery, and then uh, also uh, specialties including psychology, uh, and then data scientists for sure. And so uh, with the leadership of Eric Lee and with uh, the president-elect in Ramo Naidu and with our vice president in uh, Kauser Elmer Delfon, I think we've really done a, a, a wonderful job bringing people together during this time where we've been so socially isolated with uh, COVID-19. So now that we're all emerging and our surgery centers are open and our hospitals are open, it's uh, important to kind of readdress these important strategies in uh, treating spinal stenosis. So our faculty tonight, again, I, we've really had uh, a wonderful opportunity uh, to um, really, I think, pull from some of the greatest minds that we have in our space, and they just have to be located uh, on uh, the Pacific side of the continent. And so uh, we have Michael Leong, who's a good friend and colleague. He's, I, I'm uh, happy to say, professor at Stanford University. And so he's going to talk a lot about uh, some of the work uh, that, that he's done in this space. And then also my really good friend and colleague, uh, Ramo, uh, 
uh, Naidu. Uh, he's a luminary in our field, and I think he's uh, a, you know, one of the thought leaders that we have, and, and I look forward to his continued partnership and leadership in, within this society. Uh, our agenda is pretty simple, um, and this is a CME event, uh, so uh, we have slotted to have uh, to spend some time together tonight for about an hour and a half. Uh, if we have questions that last us long, we're happy to uh, make sure that we uh, you're fulfilled after this webinar. But our agenda is pretty simple. Uh, Michael's going to talk a little bit about the uh, direct percutaneous lumbar spine decompression strategies. Ramo is going to talk a little bit about the indirect methods. And then uh, Ramo and I have the pleasure in demonstrating these techniques uh, with a, I think, an innovative uh, video presentation that we'll provide. And then lastly, we'll have an opportunity for a little roundtable uh, where I'll moderate some questions from uh, you all uh, regarding these techniques. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Leon. So Michael, take it away. Great. Hey, thanks for everyone for joining in. And actually, thanks for the invitation, Jason and Ramu. Anyway, so I have some disclosures. Uh, the main one I think that impacts this lecture today is I'm on the advisory panel for Virtos. Uh, and, uh, but I believe that this presentation will be pretty clear and um, will not be uh, biased. Um, can we go to the next slide, Pete? Uh, these are just some references that I have. Um, if you want to go back and uh, go look up things in more detail, uh, you're welcome to uh, look at these. They expand the bridge of what is the uh, consensus guidelines for lumbar spinal stenosis, as well as the earlier studies and the latest studies. Next slide, please. So what are the objectives tonight? Um, oh, before I forget, um, if Dr. Coleman is out there and tuned in, uh, we're all thinking about you. Um, but um, objectives, what's the general treatment paradigm for lumbar spinal stenosis? Um, I'm going to give a very brief presentation about this percutaneous lumbar decompressive type procedure. What's the main study that uh, and the highlights of data from that about the rationale for using this for lumbar spinal stenosis? And just as a bridge, uh, a comparison of this percutaneous laminotomy with one interspinous spacer that uh, Dr. Naidu is going to talk about. Next slide, please. Okay, so while everyone's still trying to get into this and wake up, and I need to do the same, um, what is lumbar spinal stenosis? Why, uh, why is it here, and what do we need to do about it, and what do we typically do about it? Well, NAS defines lumbar spinal stenosis as a condition in which there's diminished space for neural and vascular elements at the lumbar spine. You know, this number next, this 50, seems like it keeps getting lower and lower, um, uh, uh, you know, as, as we go forward, um, almost making me a little uncomfortable. Um, there's about 500,000 U.S. residents that have um, uh, lumbar spinal stenosis for our current estimate and probably more. And the traditional treatments that you have are ones that we all do in our practice. Physical therapy, a um, little bit of medication, usually less, uh, more non-opioids, usually less opioids, and epidurals um, on the way to surgical decompression, possibly. Next slide, please. So I got to use this uh, slide. I'm sorry, Ramo, I stole it because I got to go first. But this is the classic sharpen cart sign. And so this is the one where patients are leaning forward when they're walking in order to decrease the compression and the lumbar spinal stenosis symptoms. Sitting also does the same thing. Next slide, please. So what do you find on lumbar spinal stenosis and physical exam? Well, the truth is, sometimes people just don't have any symptoms at all. Usually they do, otherwise they wouldn't come visit us at the office. And when they do, oftentimes for central canal stenosis, they'll have something called neurogenic claudication, which is a hallmark. Um, they may have that shopping cart sign that we just saw a minute ago, 
some things that were kind of interesting to me when I was preparing this talk is the main um, motor weakness finding was weakness at the L5. And also there is an, uh, a, um, a, a test called the stoop test, which is the patient's actually asked to uh, produce it with an exaggerated lumbar extension, which I don't think I've ever done in my practice, but it exists, so I figured you would want to hear about it. Next slide. And when you look at this, um, you'll see that where I, I feel the percutaneous decompressive laminotomy procedure, or as the company calls it, the mild procedure, is right here, um, uh, just like a kind of a glorified epidural. It's somewhere like a bridge procedure between epidurals and moving towards implanting things into the spine or even going to more invasive surgeries. Next slide. If there's one slide that um, I would like you guys to remember, if you forget everything else about this uh, first talk, this is the one slide. And this slide is because it, it tells you everything you need to know about who's ready and right, basically, for to do a, um, a percutaneous decompressive procedure. So they have to have lumbar spinal stenosis. They should have neurogenic claudication. And you, I personally want to see their image. I want to see a sagittal film like what you see on the screen, which is they have ligamentum flavum hypertrophy of greater than 2.5 millimeters. I kind of don't want to see it on the day of the procedure because sometimes they don't bring the disc and they don't bring their films. But if we have these three criteria, then that gives me the go ahead towards um, thinking about this procedure. Next slide, please. This is just a, um, a, a visualization of what comes in the kit. Most things that you need, not everything, but most things come in this kit that's provided, which is a trocar, stabilizer, making sure you don't go too deep, and a bone and tissue sculpture for um, taking away the tissue. Next slide. And there's really a four-step process that's outlined here. And the four step process is that the first step, believe it or not, is you have to get an epidural. Why? Because if you don't have an epidural, you don't know how deep you need to be. And you also don't know what the baseline is before you do the procedure and that you've been successful. So you've got to get an epidural. If you can't get it at the level that you see here, I mean, all cartoons make it seem super simple. But if you can't get it at the level where the tight spinal stenosis is, you can do a caudal and then thread a catheter up to the level of the treatment. It's not ideal, but you know you got to do. You have to do what it takes in order to be able to do the procedure. Then you create a portal. Oh, sorry. Um, so um, then you create a portal. You do the bone sculpting and then the tissue sculpting, and then um, the closure is actually you no. Know, we don't even need to use sutures anymore. You just use some steri strips and. Uh, typically, there's not that much bleeding. Next slide. Um, this slide uh, about the streamline technique um, and with the target, it just means that originally when they taught us how to do the procedure, that we would go on one side and then we would go on the other side of the spinous process. Well, you can actually just do an incision in the middle and it will actually keep you tighter towards the spinous process on one side and the other. And so this um, newer technique with a single incision, it lets you be a little bit quicker. It actually keeps you linearly so that you don't go at an odd angle and sort of cross over. And it just gives you a little bit less time for, um, for, um, for the entire procedure. Um, and also um, you only have one area that you need to steri-strip for the closure. Next slide. Okay, so this was a patient, this is an example, and this is a story that I tell most people when they ask me about percutaneous uh, decompressive laminotomy procedures. So I was at, a, um, I was at a, uh, um, uh, um, an external surgery center, so I wasn't at the main hospital or hub, and this was the first um, percutaneous lumbar decompressive procedure that they had. It just happened that I was doing the procedure, it could have been another faculty member, but I was there. And um, 
I, I have to tell you, it took me longer to do the in-service in order to tell them about all the pieces and things like that than just to do the procedure. And like I said, it can be, not always, it can be uh, like a glorified epidural. And this one was done in approximately four minutes from, uh, from start to finish. And I actually asked uh, my representative who was with me, I said, well, shouldn't we do the other side, et cetera? And at that point he said, why? I mean, the whole thing is all wide open at this point. So we just stopped. And um, luckily, you know, when you're doing new, introducing new procedures at a surgery center, you want it to go really well for the first one to three of them because you want to make sure that you get enough momentum so you can keep going. And so they allowed us to keep going. Next slide. Okay, so what's some of the data that we've got? So, um, uh, so the MIDAS Encore study protocol. So this is the first or the main randomized study, prospective randomized controlled trial of this percutaneous decompressive laminotomy versus um, epidural steroid injections. So they carried out this um, comparison with epidurals for one year, but they carried out for the entire, for the, the procedure itself, this percutaneous decompression, all the way through baseline, six months, one year, two years. And the main um, outcome measures were uh, the pain rating scale and the ODI. Next slide, please. And the population, remember that slide with the three things on there about lumbar spinal stenosis, neurogenic claudication. So guess what? These are the people that got enrolled, but uh, they were 65 years and older, um, some things that you need to see at the bottom are there's no surgery at any of the treatment levels and you have less than grade three spondylolithesis. Next slide. You guys can read this as well as I can or look at the pictures. Um, so for this, uh, uh, for this study, for the uh, MIDAS uh, study, you've got improvement on Oswestry Disability Index of about 22 points. And also there's some benefit on pain scales when compared to epidurals. Next slide. Now, you know, what I hear a lot is that, well, mild, or I'm sorry, the percutaneous decompressive um, treatment or this minimally invasive lumbar decompression, um, it only works on central canal stenosis, but not all the patients had just central canal stenosis. And it actually worked for people that have more than just central canal stenosis, because that's what we see in our practice. Also, the ODI uh, point change, it actually was improved um, regardless of what kind of stenosis type. Next slide. And you think, well, they've got lumbar um, uh, ligamentoflavum uh, hypertrophy. Well, what about all the disc stuff and facets and things like that? Do we have to do all of that first? Well, not necessarily. And so 95% of the patients had, like in our practice, more than one thing going on for their back pain. And it, this actually worked, even though, it, the, so other back conditions don't have to be excluded per se, or you don't have to do everything else before you do the mild procedure. They have lumbar spinal stenosis, it can help. Next slide. Oh, this is a cartoon. Okay, so the main thing about this one is that um, you can see for this procedure, and it really is true for the patients that get benefit and help from it, you'll see them, they're kind of hunched over before they go into the operating room, they get the procedure. When they get into the recovery room, I've seen not one or not infrequently, they just stand up and they are just like, I haven't stood up straight in forever. Now, um, I don't do this other procedure that um, Dr. Um, Naidu does, but uh, that's what my experience has been for many of the people that have had this percutaneous decompressive procedure. It's been sort of miraculous for them. And they can just go back to normal activities like an epidural, Within 24 hours, they do their exercises. They're kind of unbelieving a little bit with it. And you gotta realize they're unbelieving. Um, and some of the patients that we get are a little bit more mature. So when you have somebody in their 80s and 90s that they can just get up and go 
after 24 hours. It's pretty good. Next slide. Oh, yeah. So uh, how many people have had uh, COVID that's in influenced their uh, surgery center practice now? Every practice, right? So the main thing with this, and I was involved in another webinar about uh, talking about what dosage of, of, of steroids we should be using or should we change it and all this other stuff. This one with a percutaneous decompressive procedure, you can kind of get rid of the steroid. I know that some people in the past, they used to use it, but you don't have to. And maybe that's what the future should be, which is rather than having everyone just come back for epidural steroids kind of to death, um, you can give them a procedure that will sort of taper that off or, or eliminate it and that may last for a prolonged or way prolonged period of time. Next slide. Okay, so here's my uh, uh, bridge slides to uh, the next presentation. Okay, so what about these interspinous spacers, which I actually don't do, but um, you know, what is the comparison? So I took um, kind of an academic approach to this because I had to, and I kind of looked at it with data, and I thought that that would be a, 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 a smart way of doing it. Uh, next slide. So if you look at the literature and look at the review for both of them, um, and I had to use the device name because there's only one device for percutaneous uh, lumbar decompression so far, and then there's only one um, uh, interspinous spacer like this, like the Superion right now. But both these two devices, they came out since uh, uh, about 2010 with their studies. Uh, the mild um, device has about eight studies and two RCTs, et cetera. But there's modest evidence with the Midas Encore trial with a two-year follow-up. There's no blinding. Um, Superion has five studies, but uh, with the IDE trial was the only RCT trial. So there's a five-year improvement of 84% of the patients. According to the MIS guidelines, which we're using for treatment of lumbar spinal stenosis, both mild and superior have level one evidence, but both of them are based on a single randomized trial for both devices. So what's the conclusion? Next slide. Okay, so adults get back pain. If we live long enough, we're probably gonna get spinal stenosis too. Um, and epidural steroids have moderate to low quality evidence for back pain with radiation to legs. But now we're looking at things a little differently. I mean, I did my initial presentation for this percutaneous decompressive procedure at CIS. And CIS, or the Spine Interventional Society, is looking at steroid accumulation over a patient's lifetime. And then we get to COVID, where you don't want to contribute to somebody and perhaps do them in. So, then you've got this percutaneous decompressive laminotomy. It seems like a bridge between epidural injections and implants or surgery. You also have interspinous spacers. Maybe, well, you know what? I'm just gonna let the next, um, uh, the next session speak for itself. And then both mild and superior, they have level one evidence based on one RCT alone. So just food for thought. Thanks for listening to my section. Uh, I have to give a shout out because she's asking me to. So um, shout out to Dr. Watford and Dr. Mathias as well. Great job, Dr. Luang. Thanks, Mike. That was fantastic. All right, everyone. So uh, now I'm in and I'm gonna talk about indirect percutaneous lumbar spine decompression. Next slide. And here are my disclosures, and I actually work with uh, both companies, um, but frankly, I do a lot more of the indirect uh, interspinous spacers, and that's what I'll be talking to you about tonight. Next slide, please. So Mike's done a great job giving us an overview of, of the lumbar spinal stenosis diagnosis, uh, patient selection, et cetera. I didn't want to repeat too much of that, and he stole my slides. No, I'm joking. Uh, but we didn't want to repeat too many things. So what I really wanted to do is dig in a little bit more into the anatomy 
because lumbar spinal stenosis is, is a complex heterogeneous disease, right? Um, there are different forms of lumbar spinal stenosis. There is stenosis, as Mike alluded to, of the central canal, of the lateral recess, as well as the neuroforamen. And so these therapies actually treat different aspects of stenosis. And so there might be patients who benefit more from one type of procedure versus the other because of these different forms of stenosis. And, and when, I, when I group them into that tricompartmental model, I want to look a little bit further and think about all the different things that happen to the spine over time, right? So the, the degenerative cascade. Um, so we certainly know what happens with a bulging disc, which certainly can impinge the anterior epidural space and the anterior spinal canal. Uh, then you can develop facet hypertrophy, which as they enlarge in can again pinch on the sides of the lateral recess. You can have osteophytes around the neuroforamen. You can have ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, as Mike has alluded to. And so there are multiple sources and causes uh, to stenosis that you have to take into account when you evaluate your patients uh, in person and then the radiographs as well. Uh, next slide. I think of the spine as a stack of three-legged stools. And so imagine each uh, functional spinal unit, which includes the vertebral body and the pedicles and the spinous processes as one single unit. That one unit for me is a three-legged stool. The biggest leg is the leg that is the vertebral body uh, sitting on the intervertebral disc, which is a joint. And then you have the two posterior joints, the facet joints. So each unit is stacked on top of each other like uh, two three-legged stools on top of each other. Now imagine what happens when a disc herniates. Uh, one of the legs gets shortened and it imposes pressure on the other two legs, okay? What happens to those other joints, the facet joints? Well, there's increased pressure, there's increased stress. Patients can develop pain. You know, we have interventions for that. The joints over time hypertrophy. And again, now it contributes to stenosis. I think one of the interesting things about the interspinous spacer that I'm gonna talk about is that it's placed in between those spinous processes. And what it can do is it decreases the force load on the facet joints and the intervertebral disc. So it's basically acting like the fourth leg of that stool. And why it differentiates from another technology, the X-stop, is it's not fixated to the bone. So the X-stop, which is a, a procedure done by surgeons, where they actually open up the spine and they, they secure that device in between those spinous processes, it's actually fixed to the spinous processes. So when the patient flexes or extends or moves laterally, the spinous processes at those two levels are fixed. Whereas with this indirect interspinous, or excuse me, uh, the interspinous spacer, there, uh, there's an allowance for motion. So the cam lobes that are in between are allowing the spinous processes to move and therefore the force is now distributed to four points rather than just three. So I think that's an important point and, and it's one of the reasons I believe this particular technology lasts for a long period of time. It's got durable results, which I'll get into in the IDE, but could also potentially be a preventative therapy. And Mike already said it in his last slide, it actually prevents some of these issues. Next slide. So let's go back to that, that slide regarding the, the lumbar spine. So if you look at sort of the top of the spine, the L1, T12 here at the very top of this picture, think about that as a, as a 15 year old person, you know, uh, who's super healthy, athletic, they have a normal intervertebral disc. And imagine as you go down that spine, what happens to an individual every 10 or 15 years, right? So someone in their 30s or 50s, uh, you know, their discs degenerate, uh, they get a disc bulge, right? They either develop a, a lumbar radiculopathy, or axial back pain associated with flexion, uh, you have the herniation. And then eventually, as we all know, whether it's with our interventions or without, or with physical therapy or whatever else, medications, et cetera, generally those patients do improve. And your body is naturally healing that area, developing fibrosis and scar tissue in the anterior spinal canal. Um, and then what happens over time is all of those things I was mentioning, uh, the facet joints hypertrophy, the ligamentum flavum hypertrophies, and now you're starting to see patients who develop the symptoms of lumbar spinal stenosis going into their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100s. And so that is the cascade of events that occurs over time. And the big question for us is, can we do anything about it to prevent it? 
And so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm super interested in interspinal spacers. Um, and again, going down that cascade, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, what's happening to that individual over time. And as many of you know, you know that this is a perpetually worsening disease if you don't do something about it. Uh, if you notice it and a patient comes to you and they say, yeah, you know, I'm having some difficulty with low back pain after I walk 200 yards um, and I have to sit down in order to alleviate that pain. If that patient doesn't do anything for five years, you can imagine when they come back to you, they're not gonna be able to walk 100 yards. Probably the next time they see you, it's 50 yards, 20 yards, 10 yards, and it's a cascading event. So um, that's really the discussion I think for us going forward. Next slide. The indications for use with interspinous spacers include the following. It's neurogenic intermittent claudication, secondary to a diagnosis of moderate degenerative LSS. Uh, these are individuals, as Mike alluded to, that get relief from flexion um, and the, the symptoms worsen with standing or walking a certain period of time. Uh, patients should have gone through conservative care for at least six months. That includes physical therapy, epidural steroid injections, medications. Um, and per uh, treatment time, you are allowed to do up to two levels per the FDA between L1 and L5. Next slide. So neurogenic intermittent claudication. Um, it shouldn't be a new concept to any of you. I remember learning about this in medical school. It's kind of interesting through my residency and pain fellowship, I kind of lost sight of what it was. And then as these technologies came back, uh, both the mild and, and this interspinous space or vertiflex, then I started to realize what neurogenic intermittent claudication was more and more, and that I was seeing it all of the time. So the symptoms associated with it are pain, uh, but it's not always pain. It can be cramping, it can be weakness, it can be tingling. Um, it can, it, patients can come to you saying, you know, my, I know my leg is there, but it doesn't feel like my leg. It feels like it's doing something different, like the nerves aren't connecting. Uh, the pain is generally worsened when walking or standing, gets relieved with flexion. It can be unilateral, but it can also be bilateral. Um, and then you have to confirm with radiographic findings uh, that there is indeed lumbar spinal stenosis. Next slide. So again, comparing what happens with flexion extension, as you can imagine, when you flex that spine, it's gonna clamp down on the spinal canal as well as the neural foramina. And then when you, uh, uh, excuse me, when you extend, and then when you flex, you open up the spinal canal and the neural foramina, as you can see from left to right. And so the purpose of the inner spinous spacer is to be an extension blocker, to prevent you from extending and closing down the central canal, the lateral recess, and the neural foramina to a great degree. Next slide. So one of the advantages to using the interspinous spacer that I'm talking about here is that as you advance it, you're protected by the lamina. Um, so you really can't advance it too far. And that's really the only thing you can do to screw up this procedure is put it into the spinal canal. So obviously everything we educate patient, people on and everything we're watching for fluoroscopically is to ensure that the device stays behind the spinal laminar line. Next slide. Now we'll get into the evidence. And I'm so glad I'm, I'm doing this with Mike because he and I, as, as well as Jason, we know that evidence is everything. Everything we decide to do in interventional pain must be based on sound studies. And uh, the IDE, as Mike alluded to, uh, started enrollment in 2010, ended in 2012, and the five-year data uh, completed in February 2017. As I mentioned, this was a head-to-head a, a -head, uh, Superion versus XStop, and they were able to obtain uh, 200 patients approximately in each group, and they followed these patients out to five years, publishing data for each year uh, point. Next slide. So the primary outcomes were success in two of three Zurich Claudication questionnaire domains. Uh, that includes symptoms, function, and patient satisfaction. And as you can see here at the two, three, four, and five year marks, the primary outcome was met in greater than 80% of patients. I think what's really telling here is number one, uh, this company prior to its acquisition by Boston Scientific chose to follow patients out to five years. Um, really, if you look at uh, uh, you know the outcomes and the durations of looking at outcomes in our field, the longest thing has been two years. So I think it was a great investment to look at the outcomes at the five-year mark uh, 
because that can really prove to our payers that we can provide a cost-effective procedure in that it's durable, it's sustainable. Because what's the slant against a lot of the things we do, whether it's spinal cord stimulation or radiofrequency ablation or even spine surgery, is that what happens to that individual a year or two or three later? Do they have to get the procedure again? Do they have to then go on to the next thing? Um, so to have five years durable results is really uh, not only a good thing to look at, but to see it actually play out was, was quite remarkable. Other observations regarding reoperations, revisions, major complications, and additional treatments, again, you can see uh, greater than 80%. Next slide. Secondary uh, endpoints include uh, looking at those three domains, but again, pain scores, uh, which again should not be the primary thing we're looking at in our studies, and the Oz Western Disability Index. Um, so they did look at looking at a 50% reduction in their pain of the leg as well as the back, and that was met uh, for you know 75 to 80 percent of patients, depending on which domain you look at here. And for the Oz Westry, uh, you can see that uh, about 60 percent of patients met the primary outcome there. Next slide. So going beyond the IDE, as Mike mentioned, uh, we do have some other observational studies, and and the primary reason for these studies was to look at some of the other potential benefits with the interspinous spacers. And the first thing to come out was during the midst and the peak of the opioid epidemic was really what could this do for opioid uh, prescribing. And yes, you can look at uh, opioid prescribing data very suspiciously because of course you can change your prescribing behaviors, et cetera. But nonetheless, uh, between the baseline and the five-year mark, looking at a proportion of those patients from the IDE, uh, 85% decrease uh, in the, the subjects that were using opioids, and most had eliminated opioids completely. Um, next slide. Dr. Falowski and his colleagues, Dr. Syed, uh, Dr. Deer, also looked at the biomechanics uh, with the interspinous spacer in cadavers. So this is a cadaveric study. Uh, the question was, what do we see radiographically uh, with the neuroforaminal height, the central canal height, uh, distance, diameter, et cetera? And what was noted is, is that there were improvements in all of these dimensions. And it really does go to show, and I think uh, Mike would agree, uh, advocating for uh, his direct percutaneous procedure in that it doesn't take a lot of increased space to make a huge difference in a patient's symptoms and their quality of life and function. Um, next slide. So going a little bit deeper into, into what this study showed was that they started measuring once the interspinous spacer was put in compared to baseline, what happened to several types of dimensions, including foraminal width and height, the cross-sectional area of the foramen, the subarticular diameter, and then the central canal diameter and the whole canal area. And what you can see here, the laterality really isn't of importance because they were just seeing that and, and noting that. But what you can see here is that there's an improvement in basically all of those uh, parameters, maybe the most suspect of the subarticular diameter. But nonetheless, if you look at the whole canal area, there was an increase by 13%. Not a huge amount, but probably that's all we need when it comes to lumbar spinal stenosis. Next slide. So one of the early... Uh, posters to come out for NANS uh, after Vertiflex was introduced to the commercial market was looking at its combination with spinal cord simulation. I contributed a few cases, uh, Dr. Deer published with Dr. Mehta and others, um, because there were a lot of spinal cord simulation patients that we all had who had lumbar spinal stenosis, but we didn't have a great therapy for it. And the direct percutaneous procedure had gone through its roller coaster with reimbursement. And so we were kind of without something. So when we were introduced to this procedure, we I personally, in my practice, I called up all those patients who weren't doing that well with their stimulation, but had lumbar spinal stenosis and put in these interspinous spacers. And lo and behold, those patients did great. Uh, and so uh, the way we're looking at it now is now we're seeing patients who do get interspinous spacers, but perhaps, you know, over time or, or perhaps it doesn't relieve all of their symptoms, then you com combo it with spinal cord stimulation and you can see improved benefits. And, and the idea here is that the interspinous spacer is addressing the mechanical obstruction uh, to the nerves and that the spinal cord simulation is actually addressing the neuropathic components. So it's kind of a, a twofer, if you will. Of course, select these combo therapies in the right patients, but it's an interesting idea where you can see not only an additive effect, but potentially a synergistic effect with the combination.
Next slide. So a couple of posters that Dr. Mehta and I did uh, looking at particular uh, patient uh, populations. Uh, the first is in, in really sick patients. And, and the reason why we wanted to publish this was that I'm in an orthopedic practice. I work with uh, two phenomenal spine surgeons. And, and the way I, I was able to introduce the interspinous spacer was I, I would tell those surgeons, hey, if you have patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, but they're not surgical candidates, give them to me. Let me see what I can do with them and this procedure. And they were happy to do that. And as, as an anesthesiologist, I could certainly uh, control the anesthesia program for them so that I can mitigate those risks, right? So I'd get the patients with uh, congestive heart failure or you know, stage four kidney disease or diabetes that was not well controlled, you know, the, the really challenging patients. And, and really the biggest danger was the anesthetic plan. It wasn't the actual surgery, but again, I could do that. And because this procedure can take me 10 minutes to do for a single level, um, I knew that I could get away with it, you know, even with local, uh, even a spinal, uh, or at least you know, managing the MAC uh, if I needed to in a safe uh, and effective way. So we took these really sick patients and we, and we did these procedures. This was a retrospective review, again, not prospective, randomized or anything like that, but just a retrospective review, looking at two institutions in Austin, Texas and here in Marin County. And we, we had about 46 patients and we found a significant improvement in, in their pain scores uh, as well as their function. And so the, simply the purpose of this was just to say, hey, we can take some of the sickest patients and, and actually put this in and see improvements in their pain. And one of the added benefits from this was that a lot of these patients uh, went back to the cardiologist and our cardi cardiology group is across the hallway from us. And what happened was those patients who were morbidly obese or had all these uh, congestive heart failure issues started to exercise more. They could actually walk a much longer distance and then the cardiologist noticed a significant improvement in their cardiac health. So I actually got referrals for interspinous spacers from cardiologists uh, soon after doing this. Um, but it goes to show the significant improvement you can see in one's life uh, with this, and, and you can do it safely. Next slide. The next patient population were those individuals who had already gone through a fusion, a lumbar spinal fusion, but had developed over time adjacent level disease. So this is a very common phenomenon, whether uh, above or below that fusion. Of course, you can imagine that degenerative cascade sort of accelerates because we've taken away some of the shock absorption. And now you can start to see stenosis above or below those fusions. And again, Dr. Mehta and I pooled our data together, again, retrospective. And again, though, we showed that there was a significant improvement in their pain scores after this procedure. And again, one of the little Stories from this is that when those patients compared what the interspinous sp spacer procedure was like compared to their open laminectomy plus fusion, they were totally shocked, right? Because they were able to get up and walk basically right after the procedure and the activity restrictions, although there are some, which I'll, we'll get into, I'm sure, in the panel, they were certainly not as great as what they had to go through with that open surgery and certainly uh, didn't have to wait several months to see the benefits. They were seeing the benefits much sooner. Next slide. So what are the future directions with interspinous spacers? Well, you know, as Mike alluded to, we need more uh, data, but really good data. You know, it's not just more observational studies. We actually need more randomized controlled trials and we need head-to-head -head trials. Um, one of the things I'm most interested in, whether it's with percutaneous direct versus uh, indirect and interspinous spacers or versus laminectomy, uh, whatever it is, as a, as a scientist, I am open to obviously taking uh, this particular technology and seeing what it can do versus anything else. Um, furthermore, there's an interest in expanding indications. You know, wh what else can we do with this if there is potentially uh, an improvement in neuroforaminal height? Is there the possibility that it could be used for very specific types of lumbar radiculopathy? That's a big question. Um, and we, we'd like to see potentially uh, the establishment of interspinous spacers as long as the data looks good as a potential uh, standard of care because we've proven uh, a fairly good uh, amount of safety has been proven, uh, not only with the IDE, but post-market. Uh, and we're continuing to see good outcomes. Uh, and then as I alluded to early on, you know, what does that fourth leg do to the prevention of the development of lumbar spinal stenosis? So that's something I'm super interested in. Um, it's very preliminary, uh, but we'll see what we can do uh, moving ahead. So I appreciate everyone uh, listening tonight. Uh, now's the fun part. Uh, Dr. Pope is going to show us a live demonstration. <laughs> 
uh, of his procedure. Ramla, thanks. Uh, and, and Michael, thank you. I, I, before we, as we, we get the um, video started, uh, I think there's a lot of innovation in uh, spinal stenosis treatment. And when we look at the two randomized control trials that we have uh, within our space for the direct strategy of decompression, and when we think about the indirect strategy, clearly there's a need, specifically as we move away from epidural injection and repeated epidural injection, appreciating uh, that um, we have data and we have data to suggest not only that uh, direct and indirect strategies are helpful for the short term, but also for the long term. When Dr. Deere and Grinder and myself and a bunch of others wrote that MISC guideline uh, 1.0, one of the decision tree strategies when we looked at which therapy to reach for was certainly a durability assessment, which is very similar to, to both, if not equal, along with the VAS reduction based on a point reduction from baseline scores, which were also very similar, but it was really the degree of instability. And I think that's important to assess. And so when we get into the panel, we'll talk a little bit about instability assessment, preoperative workup. Uh, clearly, people don't have spinal stenosis from a variety of different, uh, or they have spinal stenosis from a variety of different sources. And as Ramo describes, and, and I, I know that I'm going to ask this on the panel, so I appreciate that you, uh, you both will be ready for this question. But oftentimes, we see people that have previous surgery with adjacent level disease and stenosis. And sometimes those are folks that have a fusion and they have a spinous process that may be able to support an inner spinous spacer. Oftentimes they don't, and they may have had a laminectomy and now they have adjacent level stenosis. And so clearly choosing the right therapy for the patient at the right time is critical. What would be interesting to note is as pain providers, are we going to treat that patient as having failed back surgery syndrome when they have clearly neurogenic claudication? Would we offer them neuromodulation or would we offer them, I think, a uh, mechanical decompressive strategy? So I'm going to prime the pump associated with that. I know that uh, Stephanie is loading our video, so uh, we'll get the video up and running now. Um, so uh, this is uh, the uh, direct strategy for decompression. Uh, clearly, you want to make sure that uh, the interspinous space is uh, demarcated in the middle so the pedicles are equidistant. Uh, Michael talked about doing an epidural injection at the level of uh, the decompression, I typically do my epidural injection, if I do one, the level above. And the reason being is I use a 22-gauge needle. I want to make it really minimally invasive for the patient. Um, the epidural gram serves as kind of the border in which we are decompressing uh, the ligamentum. And if we're aware of our anatomy, we know that the ligamentum flavum is posterior to the epidural space. So we're really not even in the epidural space when we're doing this decompression. So when we talk to patients about how safe this procedure is, one can make the argument that doing an epidural is more invasive, appreciating that you're deeper and closer to the nerves. Uh, when we do uh, the epidural gram, I think it's important to really appreciate that I like to put it in the midline uh, and the midline, I think, is critical because uh, we, try to, we, we want to try to minimize the number of pokes and prods and touches uh, for the patient. And so uh, doing midline strategies oftentimes will allow for an epidural gram to, to be visualized if one chooses to do that, uh, to define that, that border as we do our decompression to make sure that we're uh, capturing the ligamentum flavum, those posterior fibers of the ligamentum flavum, keeping the anterior border intact and allowing for, I think, a really uh, satisfying decompression. Um, the, this procedure, I think Ramo uh, talked a little bit about, and, and Michael did too, about uh, anesthesia requirement. One of the beauties associated with this therapy uh, 
is frankly one that I, I do this, I'd say 85 to 90% of the time under local anesthesia. And I book these cases very similar to my spinal cord stimulation trials. So uh, oftentimes we're in and out of the room in about 20 minutes. So uh, again, as we see here, I have my epidural uh, needle placed. I have the dye uh, creating an epidural gram. Uh, again, if one chooses to do that, and then um, we uh, use the, uh, the portal as I placed here, accessing the inner laminar space of the area that we're gonna be decompressing. Uh, we uh, place this uh, to make sure that uh, the trocar is stabilized and the portal is stabilized. Um, identifying again that we're gonna be uh, decompressing underneath the lamina. So I always talk to patients about um, visualizing this as kind of a, a house. And so the lamina represents the roof of the house. And so the ligamentum flavum uh, it was represented by the insulation underneath the roof of the house. And so our goal is to remove that insulation, keeping the roof in place. So after we've placed our portal, uh, we have our depth gauge and I usually dial it down to 15. Uh, and that allows for uh, exit of the, um, of the tissue sculptor and the bone rounder appropriately. Certainly there's an, a target that we're looking for and our target location is largely going to be right underneath the lamina. And there's different bite techniques and strategies in doing this. Oftentimes when I place my, um, my bone rounder, I'll take a couple of bites inferiorly along the, the posterior lamina if there is one there and then I will advance uh, uh, superiorly to capture that area right underneath the lamina above, which is that really meaty part of the ligamentum. Uh, and I think that's a really important piece. Uh, it does take a little door knobbing to try to get this in. Uh, as you'll notice, as I'm doing the decompression, my east-west analysis is based on an AP view. And then I take a contralateral CLO at about 45 degrees. And that's oftentimes how I'm doing my biting. And I think that's critical because it really gives you a nice view of the lamina and where you are as you're doing the decompression. Um, so again, this is kind of the space where you want to have your, your, um, your tissue sculptor and your bone rounder. And again, I start with the, with the bone rounder. The bone rounder, I think, is important to start with because you first have to access that area where the ligamentum is. And that's really important. So we want to make sure that as we, we don't want to decompress in the wrong area. And I think a lot of this and, and a lot of the work that I've done, I, I do both the inner spinous spacer uh, and I also do the, this direct decompressive strategy. Um, and I've had experience with both and I've presented data on both. And I think uh, it, it's important to appreciate that you have to put the thing in the right spot in order for it to work. Uh, the, the beauty of the bone rounder is one that it has a blunted end. And so uh, you're able to turn the equipment both um, uh, in the six o'clock position and the 12 o'clock position in order to do the decompression. Uh, and then as we remove this with the bone rounder, it's important to appreciate you take one bite at a time. So you take a bite at a time and you resect the tissue and then you move on to the tissue sculptor uh, and the tissue sculptor is represented uh, here shortly, but I'll describe it now because I know that we have some truncated time associated with the presentation. Largely, it looks like a duck bill. And as we perform this procedure, that is a, a, a piece of equipment that we want to make sure that we orient the duck bill within the six o'clock, uh, or I'd say the southern hemisphere as we're, uh, as we're approaching it. And that's what's represented here. And I'm pointing to that curved portion. Uh, and then we have uh, the tissue sculptor there. And then there's a little button on the back of it where you can take multiple bites. Typically, I'll take three bites at a time. Um, and then, so I'll take a bite, I'll pull the tissue sculptor back into the portal. I'll take another bite, I'll pull it back into the portal. And then I'll take another bite. And then as we, we uh, re remove that tissue from the, from the instrument, I'll hit the button on the back and that will eject this. Uh, my incision is typically midline, so I do a midline incision. It's a horizontal incision of approximately, I'd say about three and a half to four centimeters. And the, the beauty of that technique is again, making sure that we can decompress both sides. Again, I'm gonna ask the panel, so be uh, uh, 
um, aware of this, we're going to ask them if they have spinal stenosis, but they have symptoms on one side, are we going to decompress one side versus the other? Or do you do both sides most commonly? If we have two levels of stenosis, whether they're moderate or severe, are we planning on doing two levels at a time or are we doing one level and then coming back and doing the other? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the reason I keep on orienting between the east-west version along with the CLO contralateral approach is because you want to make sure that you're really carving out all of the insulation underneath the roof of the house. Um, and so I'll typically take two or three bites inferiorly, I'll take two or three bites posteriorly, and then I'll just make sure that I'm cleaning off that area. And this strategy takes largely about, I'd say, five to seven minutes. Um, uh, and if you're doing a two-level technique, I probably bake on being in the OR for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and again, we use, if I'm doing a two-level strategy, my epidural gram will usually go at the level of the superior area, superior inner laminar space where I'm going to be doing the decompression. Uh, once I um, finished, uh, largely when I removed the trocar and the system and everything else, uh, I, I actually do still stitch. I know you don't have to, but uh, we oftentimes do. Uh, and I will uh, do a subcuticular with a 4 um, And this is an epidural gram demonstrating increased dye spread. Uh, it's interesting when we talk about um, the uh, actual uh, post MRI views of whether you're using an indirect strategy or whether you're using a, um, a direct strategy. There's not a lot of difference as Rambo describes use it at post post procedure MRI, but the results are overwhelming. And we noticed that when we when we published on the MIS guidelines, really indicating that the severity of symptoms do not correlate with the severity of stenosis based on MRI. Uh, so. A little bit really goes a long way. Uh, my uh, strategy associated with um, the posterior or the, the post-operative care for these patients is essentially, again, close the incision up. I put a really small tetraderm on it. I tell them they can go ahead and shower. Don't submerge the area underwater. No post-operative antibiotics are required. And then I don't give them any restrictions. Um, and, and I think we may have gone over my disclosures previously, but I've done work both with Vertiflex in Boston uh, that's relevant to this uh, uh, lecture along with um, work with, uh, with Vertos. Um, that was a long-winded presentation. I know we have, uh, we're coming up on an hour from the time that we got started. Ron was gonna give um, the presentation on the indirect strategy as he talked about before and then we'll have time for some questions so please keep them coming and i'll make sure that we uh, get everything answered so with that i will hand it over to uh to rama all right so what i am doing here is i'm creating an interspinous line between the l2 spinous process and l3 so i go from the very bottom of the l2 spinous process to the midpoint of l3 and then I draw a straight line. Um, you can see my surgical marker is very fancy here. Uh, and this usually ends up being about a 1.5 uh, centimeter incision for a single level, uh, generally using 11 blade after I use local anesthesia. Uh, and the purpose here is to get down to the supraspinous ligament. Um, there's often been a debate about whether it's a transected or not. And one of the things from Falowski's study that I presented earlier was that there really is no uh, change in the stability of the spine if you transect it. And since the purpose of this procedure is really to get that uh, interspinous spacer right in between, I go ahead and transect it, as you can see it right here. This allows me to get dilator one, which is the next instrument, which I'm holding in my left hand, right between the spinous processes. Now, this instrument is scalloped. As you can see, it's curved on the fluoro. So it wants to sit between those two spinous processes. The key thing here is to usually aim a little bit inferiorly so it skives off the inferior spinous process. You don't want to be chipping away at the superior spinous process because of the angle uh, that it's sitting at. So you can see here, I'm basically able to get it right between and under the L2 spinous process. I mallet until I gain some purchase. And that means that the instrument is being held by the tissue and interspinous ligaments uh, between the two spinous processes. Uh, at this point, uh, once I have purchased, I check a lateral, and you can see I'm already 
50% uh, across the spinous processes, um, which looks good. Uh, the spinal laminar line is that darkened zigzag shadow. I can't show you with my cursor, but you will see I'll mallet it a little bit further in lateral position just to get it to that spinal laminar junction. Uh, so there you go. I'm right there. Uh, you can see my little head shake that I'm happy with where I'm at. And then I take the uh, cannula assembly, which actually is two pieces in one. It goes right over dilator one, and I follow it down and I mallet it right over it, okay? Uh, this is basically dilating the space, and what I'm creating is a working channel uh, to bring all the rest of the instrumentation. I usually bring this to about uh, 30 to 50% across the spinous uh, process. Now we checked a Ferguson view, both uh, AP going cranial and caudal or at the C-arm, and you can see that it's a little bit right shifted, uh, but I could work with that because I can make some adjustments as you'll see uh, to make that correct. Uh, this is called the Reamer. I have an aura nurse named Jenna, so I sometimes call it the Jenna. Looks like a Game of Thrones weapon, uh, but basically what it's doing is it's clearing out that interspinous tissue to provide a little uh, area for the uh, superior device to sit. And you can see I've taken that to the spinal laminar junction. I'm happy with how far it goes. The only thing you can do to screw this procedure up is take it too far. So just don't do that. Then I measure the distance between the spinous processes. And one of the things I do is I take multiple measurements because if there's any soft tissue or osteophytes that are sitting anywhere around that area, it's going to change your, your measurement. So I take multiple measurements just to give myself a, a higher degree of confidence that I've got the right size. And in this particular situation, I, I watch when that bar bends up and I size down from that point. Uh, and so we chose uh, the 12 millimeters, right at the 12 millimeter uh, for that. So perfect. Uh, then we load up the superior end device, uh, which you'll see in just a bit here after I take the uh, gauge out. And it's going to be arrow to arrow. Uh, I hold it by the colored cam lobes, as you can see there, and it snaps down. Uh, and then what goes through the top of that is something called simply the screwdriver. Uh, and that's what allows the uh, superior end to deploy. Uh, there is an orientation because these cam lobes have a very specific shape to sit on the superior lamina as well as the inferior lamina. So it's very important you put it in the right way so that arrow is going to face towards the head of the patient. Um, I'm just demonstrating here what happens when you open it and close it, although the camera angle is not ideal. Uh, you're getting some idea of what's happening here. So I placed that through the cannula or working channel, and now I'm looking at what it looks like under fluoroscopy. And what I want to make sure is that my cam lobes are behind the spinal lamina junction. Because I don't want them to open and hit the lamina. I want them to be behind the lamina. And that's what you can see here. I am behind the lamina. So now I'll go ahead and start to deploy, uh, just turning it. And I'm feeling for any resistance. Because if I'm hitting any resistance, it means I'm either hitting the lamina or the spinous process. Um, and you can see here, I've already started to go beyond the lamina. So I'm feeling pretty good. And now what I'll do is I'll want to check uh, AP, go cranial and caudal, to make sure those cam lobes are basically straddling the spinous process superiorly and then inferiorly. And you can see that I've done that. And I've made a slight adjustment to bring the superior end a little bit leftward because I was a little bit right shifted before. And now what I'm doing is the, the, the sagittal wiggle. Uh, so this is the only movement we really recommend. We don't want you rotating around or going side to side because that can torque the cam lobes. Even though this is strong titanium, you can with enough force bend it. So you can see here, I'm, I'm opening it up further and further. Uh, I'm getting a sense for the resistance. And at this point, you can see how easy it is to turn because I've gotten through all of the resistance. I've gotten through all the soft tissue and now it's fully deployed and it's a little bit posterior. And now my goal is to get that as anterior as possible to really that be that point fulcrum against the lamina. And that's where the fourth leg of the functional spinal unit comes in. So again, I'll check my final uh, just to make sure the cam lobes look good. And then I'll take out the screwdriver and I'll mallet this anteriorly. And really, you can't mallet it too hard unless the patient has significant osteopenia because the lamina are going to stop the cam lobes from going any further. So that's what you see here. I've gone into the spinal laminar junction, uh, and, and you'll hear an audible change uh, once that uh, superior gets to the lamina. Uh, and then what I can do here is simply release it. I'm super happy. And you release it by lifting up this lever. Uh, on the inserter, and then you'll have to do a little side-to-side -side wiggle. Oh, I want to advance a little bit further, I guess. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, lift up the lever, a little side-to-side -side wiggle. That takes the tangs out of the device, and voila, it's left in place. This is what it looks like uh, under AP. All right, I'll send it back to Jason to start up the Q&A.
Rama, well done. Sounds, it looks like you know what you're doing. That's great. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, I think Michael's going to be joining us in just a moment. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we, we've looked at different techniques associated with uh, spinal stenosis decompression. We talked about neurogenic claudication. We talked about, um, I think, some of the, of the data. And I think it's important to appreciate um, what's the anesthesia requirement. We got a, 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 um, a question from the, from the group here. Um, so we, we talked about this isn't a uh, large decompressive surgery. So the question that I would have is, uh, there, you got a little friend there too. So the question that I would have is, uh, and we'll, we'll direct this to Michael first, uh, what is your anesthesia that you typically provide for someone as you are performing um, a direct decompressive yeah. strategy? Um, honestly, it's as little as possible. And so I, I think of the procedure, again, as a glorified epidural. And so most of my epidurals, if not all of them, have either I can do them under local or just really minimal sedation. And actually, I want that. I, I, I want to make sure that we're, the patient is relatively awake before the procedure. And I think it can be done very expediently and quickly without much heavy sedation. Ramo, uh, I know that uh, you've done both strategies. Tell me a little bit about your um, philosophy or your strategy surrounding anesthesia for these procedures. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jason, that for the uh, direct percutaneous, it's similar to an SES trial sedation. It, very little uh, is required. Um, whereas this is, you know, there's an incision, there's malleting, so it does require a little bit more. Uh, I wouldn't put it as high up as a spinal cord simulator implant, but somewhere less than that. Really, any anesthesia can be used for this. Uh, the majority of the time, it's MAC. Uh, if the anesthesiologist feels like they need GA, go ahead. Absolutely can do it. Don't need neuromonitoring because we're behind the spinal canal. Um, but like I said, you know, I had those really sick patients where I had to do it with local only, and it went just fine. The only thing the patients told me was that that malleting was loud. It was disconcerting. But besides that, they didn't have any pain. They weren't uh, uncomfortable at all during it. Um, and I had a retired urologist who requested a spinal, uh, did that. So you really can do whatever you want, but a majority of the time for us, it's MAC. Very good. And I think we're, I'm gonna try to break up some of these questions in regards to preoperative considerations, intraoperative work, and then some of the postoperative considerations. Uh, in terms of, um, when we, when we looked at the NIST guidelines, we think about neuromodulation, we talk about anticoagulation management. You know, we're making really small incisions and we're using really, I think, um, uh, minimally invasive strategies to do either a direct decompression or an indirect decompression. And one of the questions that we had was a little bit about bleeding management. So a lot of the, I think, in my opinion, the best bleeding management is to avoid it. Certainly when it happens, uh, you have to be mindful of how to manage it. So. Tell me a little bit about, uh, Michael, first, your strategy um, with anticoagulants for the mild procedure. Uh, do you follow the, um, the guidances that were put out by the NAC recommendations for neuromodulation? Is it more akin to ASRA recommendations? Do you throw the whole thing out? Um, how do you approach this? So I, I typically think of the percutaneous decompressive laminotomy as following procedures you would for any epidural. Um, I realize, and I like you, um, Jason, sometimes I put a stitch in for the bottom for, um, you know, after the procedure is concluded, but I don't think of it as a higher risk than really doing um, uh, uh, a single level or multi-level epidural. Ramo, we're doing some, uh, some uh, indirect decompressive strategies. Tell me how you manage anticoagulation. Yeah, I, I follow the WIP NANS ASRA guidelines. Um, I, I think the key thing, though, is, you know, I, I, I'm a geriatric pain physician. I always joke, and I get a lot of patients on Eliquis, Sorelto, Pradax, et cetera. And I think it's important to tell your patients that there's a risk of coming off those drugs if you have to stop it for 72 or 96 hours or whatever else. Um, so I'm generally uh, documenting the risks, making sure the cardiologist is fully aware of what we're doing. Um, and then I'm usually starting them after six hours. Uh, after the surgery if I need to. So if they have a nighttime dose, they're doing it that night as long as it's at least six hours or they're starting it the next morning. Um, this procedure is behind the spinal canal. There's no epidural uh, 
impingement. So I'm not worried as much about epidural hematoma, but it's really just from the surgical risk of the incision. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and, and again, both techniques are posterior, so one can make the argument you're not even in there, but I think being careful is appropriate. Uh, when we think a little bit about preoperative considerations, I mentioned a little bit about the misguidance and we talked a little bit about um, the assessment of instability. And I think that's one of the decision tree track factors along with obviously presence of stenosis and ligament inflated hypertrophy of at least 2.5 millimeters. Grade spondy is important versus one versus two because obviously there's some guidance associated with that. So Rama, we'll start with you this time. So um, how is the best way to assess for instability of the lumbar spine to determine whether someone's a candidate for a minimally invasive indirect decompressive strategy? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, one of the sort of shifts in my practice, Jason, was that, uh, you know, I never really had to assess for this as much, right? I mean, it was sort of the thing that the surgeons did. Um, but what I ended up having to do was get those flex extension x-rays, really see what that lumbar spine was doing when the patient leaned backwards versus leaned forwards. And, you know, if you look at uh, sort of the contraindications for the indirect interspinous spacer, uh, if there's a greater than three millimeter translation, uh, or if there's greater than a grade one spondylolisthesis, uh, you can probably expect the outcomes won't be that great, uh, if not, you know, relatively contraindicated. So uh, that would be the most important thing to do is to assess those flexion extension x-rays and to really measure that out. And if you don't have that experience, get a spine surgeon or a radiologist to help you out. Um, so I, I consulted early on with the spine surgeon. He, you know, he would measure things out for me and help me understand how to do all those things. Any consideration, I just got another question. Any considerations for facet fluid? Is this to me or Mike? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if you see uh, increased signal of fluid in the facet joints, that's a suggestion that there is uh, instability of that functional spinal unit. Again, though, the severity of that fluid doesn't necessarily correlate to how much translation or instability there is on flexion and extension. So it can be a clue though, and I think a very important clue, Jason, as you're alluding to, when you look at that MRI and that you see it, you should be suspicious. Uh, and that might suggest the outcomes may not be as good as what you'd expect from the perfect patient. And Michael, this question's for you. So we're talking about the decompressive strategy. That's the direct one that you went over. Okay. Um, and we talk about uh, measurement of that 2.5 uh, millimeters of ligament inflated hypertrophy. I know I've measured that thing. And depending on how you put the little cursor in, it can uh, you know, be a little different. Um, but we also know that the severity of symptoms don't necessarily correlate with the severity of, uh, of stenosis radiographically. So uh, where do you measure this? Do you rely on, and, and I guess I'll back up by saying certainly you would recommend people looking at their own MRIs, um, but, but where do you measure this? Well, I, I, you know, in truth it's, you, it depends on the on the view and the cut that you have, but um, I uh, I do my best at uh, one correlating the the um, you know the the size of the of the darkness of the ligament of labrum from the spinal canal all the way to the end. And the thing is too that for the percutaneous decompressive procedure, I think. That, and I've talked about this before, it's typically, not always, but it's typically at L4-5 and L3-4. Those are really the two key levels that you kind of look at all the time. And it, it probably is the same for, sorry, for Spirion too, but those are really the key areas that I think of treating and doing the measurement on. So even if you see um, another area, and this may go to another question that you have, uh, another area above, those two areas are the key areas that I think you need to focus on first before moving on to other areas for doing the treatment of maybe of any of these procedures that we have. So that's a, I, mean, I think that's a good segue. So when we're talking about people that have spinal stenosis, as you identified, L3, 4, L4, 5 is pretty common. That's what we saw in the, uh, the uh, indirect data out to two years and we see that also when we looked at the direct strategy out to two years i think the question would just be if someone has two level 
stenosis. Say someone has moderate stenosis at one level, severe spinal stenosis or moderate to severe spinal stenosis in the other one, they clearly have neurogenic claudication symptoms. How would you recommend approaching that patient? Would you recommend treating both levels at the same time or would you do one level and then come back and do the other? So we'll start with Michael and then we'll go to Rama. So, and maybe this is just my own perspective, I try to do less is more. And so if, um, if I believe that most of the symptomatology and just from thinking about the structure of the spine, you would think that most of the, the pressure would be on the lower level. I try to go for the lower level first and see is there opening maybe at that level or maybe even above that. Um, I, in general, would not do more than two levels, period. And so typically, if we are going to do two levels because we looked at the sagittal MRI, I wouldn't do more than L4, L5, and L3, L4. Um, and it's just um, to do the least amount possible, get the most benefit, and get out without having any problems. But that's uh, my perspective for that. Bravo, any differences? Well, I, I try to do less is more, but, you know, the frustrating part is when you, you know, you, you have that patient, like you're describing, Jason, you know, they have one level that's really severe and the next level is kind of like, you know, 60 or 50 percent of it. And you're like, well, there is stenosis, but do I intervene or not? And then you don't. And then they show up at your practice six weeks or 12 weeks later and they're still having symptoms and you're going and they're frustrated with you. And now, you, you know, you're exposing them to another procedure, maybe a little sedation or anesthesia. That's the frustrating part. And so. Um, for me, I would say that uh, overall, I'm doing two levels versus one level 50% of the time. So it's basically an even split between the two. Um, I will generally uh, map out my logic with the patient and let them know, you know, why I'm choosing to do one or two, just so that if it doesn't work out and I choose to do the one, they're prepared for the second. Um, and the same could be asked if there's a third or fourth level. Um, but I take into account everything, right? Like the patient's tolerance for procedures the anesthetic risk, uh, all of those things play a factor on, on whether I choose one or two. So it's a great question. I don't have an easy answer for you, uh, but I, I take the account every time. So I have just uh, three more questions and we're gonna get to these the, the, and then we're gonna have some closing comments. The first one is expectations post-operatively. Now we talk about limitations post-operatively. We talk about expectations. I alluded to what I do post-operatively for these procedures. Um, We'll start with Rama. Give us the, the uh, brass tacks on what you tell patients regarding expectations of not only improvement, but also limitations after someone gets an indirect strategy. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty direct with patients, not to play on this indirect direct conversation we're having all night, but um, I tell patients, frankly, 20% of you are not going to do well with this procedure. I actually give them the negative. So they're prepared that, you know, this might not work for me. Now, some of them look at that and go, wow, 80% do pretty well. So that's, you know, it's similar to the ID and that's certainly been my registry of data as well. Um, now, as far as expectations of when that's going to occur, there's a great degree of variability. Um, it could happen literally, you know, in the PACU, it could happen two months later. I tell patients there's no major bending, lifting or twisting for six weeks. Don't expect any significant improvement for six weeks. Um, yes, it can happen earlier, but, you know, we're going to see each other at two and six weeks. So, you know, we'll kind of plot how things are going. And during those two visits, we're going to figure out your physical activity, uh, your physical therapy, et cetera, because I have noticed some patients initially not do that well, but once they get into physical therapy, that's when they really see their improvements take off. Um, so that two week visit for us, my assistant actually does a wound check, but she also gauges what they're doing, you know, are they moving around? Do they feel pretty good? And if they are, she actually accelerates their physical therapy and activity. But if they're not doing that great, we would maintain those six week restrictions. Michael. Um, so for the percutaneous decompressive procedure, some people can be feel miraculous just in the uh, recovery room that itself and they can stand up and just be amazed. However, look, this is part of a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary strategy. So if they haven't been doing their exercises or not gotten back first to baseline activity, which you can do within 24, 48 hours, and then do um, some 
um, lumbar strengthening, et cetera, I think their, their most benefit when they're going to see it is somewhere between, honestly, the same, two to four weeks or so. Because they have to get back into the group. They have to get back into their exercises. And um, you, even though they may be able to stand up straight for a period of time, it doesn't mean they're going to have any durability or duration of it when they're walking and less um, a claudication or less irritation. So it takes some time for that to, to happen with, I think, either of the procedures. And I, I typically tell people, you got to give it about a month. I'm, I'm trying to move away from this topic. Binder or no binder? I just got another question. Binder or no binder? I do binder. Three days. I go binder or no binder? Uh, no binder. Okay. Um, moving on, uh, I told you I was going to ask you this question, so I have to do it. Um, we're talking about uh, an, a new area in medicine and us as uh, interventionalists uh, minimally invasive intervening on the spine. And we've seen a lot of work uh, in the neuromodulation literature talking about repeat back surgery um, and statistically looking at the data. We always would suggest looking at the data that one should choose spinal cord stimulation over repeat operation in treating people with back and leg discomfort. Now, when you hone into that data, there's not really a clear presentation on neurogenic claudication versus not. So the, the question that I would ask is, appreciating that someone may have had a fusion that have areas of spinal stenosis that may lend themselves to either a direct or an indirect decompressive strategy, do you offer that person the minimally invasive spine uh, treatment or do you offer the neuromodulation? So we'll start with Ramo, and then we'll move over to Michael. Yeah, I I I really think that if, if it comes down to the radiographics, right? Because the symptoms are going to be similar. So if they radiographically have a mechanical obstruction, that is something that I can intervene on. Meaning there's ligaments and flavum hypertrophy. I would do direct percutaneous decompression, or uh, if there is a spinous uh, inter, uh, spinous process that I could actually put an interspinous spacer on. Uh, that's what's going to go into my algorithm for this. And if I can't do either of those things, then I'm doing stimulation. So for me, Jason, it's first MIS, figuring out the anatomy, and then uh, stimulation of the situation. So um, I, I've got to give credit to Dr. Uh, Salmasi, who's actually heading our neuromodulation conference. And why do I give him credit for it? It's because um, even though we send people for spinal cord stimulation, if he picks off, that there is an opportunity to do a minimally invasive spine uh, procedure, we're probably gonna do it. I mean, you just should. You should try it first before you do an implant, in our opinion. So it's interesting. Hey, Jason, just to, sorry to chime in again, but when I looked at my own data regarding spinal cord stimulation failures, one of the three top diagnoses was spinal stenosis. And so That's I was just say. worried that it wouldn't work. And, and until you fix the mechanical obstruction, you're not going to see the major benefits. Now, if they don't do that, great, great. Then I'll add the stim. Yeah. No, it's interesting because, you know, when I looked at, uh, I think a lot of you participated in that uh, study looking at explant on spinal cord stimulation. Major reason for explant was because the device didn't do well. And when we dove into the diagnoses of why they were placed, people can get benefit with stimulation therapy for three months or six months at a time. But it's the durability that's really critical and if we have an area of spinal stenosis identified radiographically and they have neurogenic claudication, do the minimally invasive spine strategy. If they have pain with sitting and standing that doesn't really change very much, reach for the stimulation therapy. That would be my approach. Last question, uh, and I appreciate everyone. We still got a packed house here, so I appreciate everyone still, still hanging on with us. I know we're running up on our hour and a half here. Um, we we were we, we require as a specialty referrals. So we were we require referrals, and some of those referrals, oftentimes when you talk about practices around the West and also on the East, they come from surgeons. And so some questions that we have are having a conversation with surgeons about not upsetting the balance on who's doing the surgery and who's doing the epidurals. So Michael, we'll start with you, but you know describing this uh, direct 
strategy of decompression? And how do you advertise this to your colleagues to say that people that need surgery need surgery and the people that don't, we can try this. How do you have that conversation with them? Well, um, I have an advantage and we've actually grown this. And I think that many of the practices around the country uh, do something similar, which is I actually work in the neurosurgery department uh, occasionally as their pain management guy. And so we actually have cross referrals all the time. Um, the other thing too, I have to tell you is that um, for our division, uh, any new kind of complex procedure, I'm actually proctored by neurosurgery. I'm not really proctored by the anesthesia department because you know, we're anesthesiologists, the three of us are, but you gotta get someone else to do it. And so when you can physically show them, like you guys can, that the procedure is you know, relatively similar to something they've seen before, you're not um, doing anything that they have to undo in order to get in there, possibly um, there's no epidural uh, uh, the short story is I've had surgeons show me, they're like, hey, you want to see your epidural steroid? And then they'd like scoop it out and then show it to me. If you don't have to undo something that uh, somebody has tried on your patient, then they're okay with it usually. And um, I've, we've grown the practice um, for being able to do those because um, we're proctored by neurosurgery. They, um, they can see what we're doing. They see that uh, we're not trying to take away referrals or anything like that. It's just like an, an uh, it's like a bridge. It's a bridge between really doing uh, tons and tons or frequent epidurals um, and, uh, and, and something else that will take us away from that and um, get them better candidates for surgery that are going to do better. Rano, any, uh, any differences? Uh, well, you know, I, I think this is a super important question, Jason. I, I think this relationship between pain management and spine surgeons is essential. Um, there, it is so easy for all of us to point fingers at each other and say, you know, you're you're just hacking the back, and and for them to look at us and go, you just are needle jockeys and and pill pushers, and, and that's got to really stop because that doesn't help our patients. Uh, that doesn't help the communication and network uh, that we need to have, and so. You know, as you as you guys know, I'm with you know two spine surgeons, and and that relationship obviously is collegial, but it comes down to when I present something like these procedures, it comes down to the evidence. And, and one of the things I'm proud of is that we have two level one studies supporting these things. And so to go to them and say we have this data, and they look at it and they say, yeah, it's legitimate, and yes, there's a role for it, and you know, there's a role for the things that we do as well it creates uh, this ecosystem in which we're all helping each other out. So, you know, if, if the mild didn't work out, they go on to Superion, if that didn't work out, they go on to laminectomy, that didn't go out, you know, spinal cord stimulation. The bottom line is we're all trying to help each other out while trying to mind the costs of what we're doing. Um, but it's such, an important, it's such an important part of everything. So if you're, there are any fellows listening, whatever you do in your future, make sure you befriend and create a great relationship with your surgeons just like Dr. Leung is in at Stanford, like I'm doing in private practice and Jason is doing um, for all of Sonoma and other parts where he works. So, and I think that's a good uh, thing to end on. Uh, I would say that PSPS as a society is embracing this collaboration amongst society. And so on our board, amongst the people that are on the panel here, uh, we have uh, represented neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons that are really helping us direct uh, not only these engagements that you've seen up to this series, but also moving forward. Uh, and I would remind you all, this was a CME event, so uh, please uh, remind to click in and uh, copy this and paste it uh, so you can get your credit, uh, do so within 48 hours. I think that's important, provided by Dan Miller. Um, we also have uh, the uh, an, an important piece that we have an annual meeting coming up, and I know that uh, there's still maybe some um, uh, potential COVID uh, upticks, and we're going to keep eyes on that, but all uh, things moving forward. Ramo's done a wonderful job in helping architect that meeting. We are going to have our session four of our webinar series. Uh, that'll be June 15th, and so I uh, hope that uh, we can get all of you to participate in that. Um, we have an all-star panel here, as you can see. Uh, and then we are going to have our annual meeting, 
in, in, unless the zombie apocalypse hits again uh, at the U.S. Grand Hotel in San Diego on September 11th through the 13th. So um, any questions, uh, comments, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are an inclusive society. So I want to thank our panelists for participating. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, with that, we'll conclude. Be safe. Great job, everyone. Good night.